Hey everybody, welcome to the Bridge the Gap DFS podcast. We had a bit of a hiatus, was moving back to California and was working on getting the website launched and just trying to do one project at a time now that the website's launched. I want to get back into podcasting, going to be doing this uh, from home. Some will be audio, some will be video. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and um, just see how this goes. We're going to do something a little bit different than the last of our couple podcasts. One of my favorite things to do is working one-on-one with players that are actually serious about getting better. It helps me um, know what topics are important to other people. I learn a lot of the time as much as other people are learning from me. So I thought it might be cool to record one of our, our coaching calls, lunch and learns, workshops, whatever you want to call them. I actually don't really like the word coaching. I think it sets a uh, a, a bad precedent. I, I like more of like a conversation and workshop. So we're going to just record our, our coaching call workshop. Uh, as much as I said, I don't like the word coaching call. I immediately say it. So we'll just, whatever this is, it's recorded. And I've got um, Louie who reached out to me uh, to one of the tweets that I sent out. And uh, anybody that wants help or insight, um, there's a survey that I ask people to fill out so we can make the most of our time. And um, Louis has been playing for a couple years, ready to take his game to the next level. Louis, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing very good. Yourself? Awesome, man. I'm, I'm really excited to be chatting with you. I know, um, you know this is something that we've had on the calendar for a couple weeks, and so I just want to dive right in. I'd like to start all of these workshops with, just tell me a little bit more about yourself, um, you know, what you do outside of DFS, and some of the things that led you to playing DFS. Was it season long, or just a big sports fan, or you like data? Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Well, uh, first off, I live in Canada, right? So DFS is something that was that was there for a couple of years, but wasn't very present as in, in the States, right? I actually um, discovered DFS, I think it was during a, a Blue Jays playoff run. I don't know how I fell into it. And, and I just saw an ad and I was like, oh, let me try this. And I quickly discovered that it wasn't as easy as just clicking buttons and choosing your favorite players. Um, what I do, uh, I basically work in IT for a big company. I don't want to go into much into details uh, for some obvious reasons. Um, I I love DFS. The reason why is mainly because I love sports. I love to do a lot of data analysis, and um, I feel that that has helped me up to a certain point. But I'm really ready to to try to find ways of getting better. At, uh, at, at finding more uh, more ways of, of getting different if you want. Yeah, and that totally makes sense. And I think you have a great background. Um, you know, I think what makes, and this is one of the things that we're focusing right now on the website, is so much to DFS is about showing up and executing, but you can't do that unless you have a consistent process. So there's a lot of back-end work that goes into that. So with your background in IT, um, I think that that's gonna be a, a very useful skill set to have in DFS, and I'm sure that that's one of the things that's benefiting you as well. So can you talk to us a little bit about how what you do from the IT side and the computer side um, and, and, and merge that with DFS? Is, is Have you found that that's a strength for you? Is that something that um, you're not using it all. Talk to us a little bit more about your, your background and how you apply that to DFS. Sure. Uh, at the beginning, um, I, I well, let me start back. Um, I have a bachelor's in software development and computer engineering. So that allows me to basically scrape left, right, and center data, pull data from different websites, and just look at data a different way than other people are able to, right? Some people have to to sub to some websites to get some information, I can pretty much scrape any website and be like, okay, what do I want from this? Or or what what if it's basketball minutes or whatever, and and you know correlate data from there. Um, that's mainly how I apply my 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 lifestyle to DFS and what has helped me up to here. Um, I built my own optimizer, but then I kind of gave up on it. Um, it was good. It was a cash game machine, but uh, cash games wasn't something that was interesting me. Um, and then I, I, I shifted to uh, GPP, mainly uh, MME. Once I uh, discovered Manny Laura, uh, I think you're you're aware of him. <laughs> and uh, and since then, my 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 style of play has changed a lot since then uh, because it's less of an analytics 
point of view, more of a of a roster construction side that's more asked for. But uh, I still think I I I should use what I did in the past and try to apply it to what I do now and like mix and match to, to get a better process, right? Sure. So tell me, talk to me about some of the tools that you're using right now. Uh, I mainly use Fantasy Cruncher to, to optimize everything. Uh, when I, once I discovered Fantasy Cruncher, I basically gave up on my own optimizer because I was trying to build something similar to what they're doing. And once I, I saw it, I was like, well, I can continue, but the product is there and, and, and it's pretty good. Like I, I don't want to, uh, I don't work for them. I have no alliances. I, I'm a follower of Manny Laura, but that's, that's all. I have my own subscription there. But uh, that tool has helped me to really put more focus on how to construct better lineups than actually trying to find what player to play that night. Like, oh, is this guy going to play 40 minutes? So I should play him or him. Or I go more of a general perspective of, of the slate. And from there, I start building based on some settings and and whatnot. And who are you using for projections or are you doing that yourself? Um, it depends, right? It depends on, on the sport, but I, I used to do projections, but I stopped. It, it was very time consuming and with work and school, it, it was hard for me to, to keep going at the pace I was going. Um, I mainly use either Fantasy Cruncher or I go with uh, a website called The Daily Average. Uh, they aggregate a bunch of, of projections and I feel they do a, a pretty good job with it. So um, that's mainly what I use. Perfect. So walk me through what you're most comfortable with right now and what you think you could use some, um, use me as a sounding board to, to get better that you're not as comfortable with. Well, I'll give you an example, right? Because I'm a, I like to think I'm a pretty decent uh, NHL MME player. Okay. Um, I've had some success in the past couple of years. Last year, I, I cleared a, I, I'll be honest, I cleared like $10,000, which is pretty good for an average DFS player, in my opinion. Um, that's, 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 that's way better than that. That's, that's <laughs> excellent. A five figure season in any sport is incredible. Cause if you, if you look at it and say, Oh, there's four sports, let's say you could clear five figures at all four sports. That's $40,000. You know, that's more, or not more, but that's about what most people in North America make on average for a year. And to be able to do that on the side, you know, don't I? You're, you're, you sound like a humble guy, so you're not really tooting your own horn. I'm going to toot it for you. That's incredible. That that should be the goal. Once you know, figure out what you're doing to profit four to five figures a season is absolutely incredible. But I still feel I got lucky. I still feel that it. I still feel like I miss some part of, of, of being more contrarian. I don't know if you, if, if you can follow me on that point because um, yes, I understood better how to build my rosters, but I still feel I was, I was relying too much on, on solely the projections and not necessarily my gut instinct in picking the best spot for different teams, right? So that, that's a really good uh, topic to dive into. So uh, how long have you been playing hockey? Uh, full time DFS hockey, two seasons. Okay, so what was the what were your results like the first year? Uh, the first year was very light, a lot of cash games, a little bit of GPP, and the second year, once I started doing a lot more MME, um, that's where I, I was able to get a, a good year. Okay, and then how uh, is that on DraftKings and FanDuel or just DraftKings? Uh, no, FanDuel mostly. Uh, okay, so for mostly some reason. Because I'm a low stakes player, right? I play the quarters, the the ten cents. I my bankroll is not huge, so uh, I, I like to stay in a comfortable uh, bankroll management situation where I know that if on a certain night things go south, I don't go bankrupt. So I, I like Fanduel because of their payout structure for the for the lower stakes. Uh, I feel DraftKings is way too top heavy, and it's either first or literally last. So. So that's I, I that was one of the things I was really uh, excited about when I read your survey is you are very intentional about where you're playing and what you're doing and I think that that is a habit. I don't know if where you pick that up, but so many players struggle to just understand. Hey, this is where I'm at. I'm going to put in my time here, and then I'm going to move up when 
when I can. And, and some of the times, you know, if you're supplementing your eco- income with DFS, you're not able to move up as fast as, you, as you'd like to. And there's nothing wrong with that. The fact that you're beating the game and staying where you're comfortable and putting your time in, you know, we were about to watch the World Series tonight. These guys didn't start in the major leagues. You know, a lot of these guys, you know, mm-hmm. either got drafted out of high school and went into the minors or they played college and then they worked their, their way up. You know, Aaron Judge wasn't even in the league three years ago. Now he's an all-star. So I, I just don't understand why, you know, in every walk of life, we have to put in our time. You know, you're not in your position that you're doing right now for your day job right out of elementary school, you had to put in your time elsewhere and DFS is no different. So the fact that you're mastering that or have a good grasp of that is going to help you so, so much because one of the things that most people overlook with sticking to what you're doing right now is all of the various strategies that you're going to pick up along the way by just experimenting. And like you said, if it goes poorly, so what? I can try again tomorrow. So, you know, there's just so much to be gained from from what you're doing. So I commend you on that. And in terms of what to be doing differently, I, I tend to look at everything from a DFS perspective in a three to four year window. Your first year, you don't really know what's going on. You're just trying to figure that out. You know, we don't really, I don't really count that. You know, that first year, the year that you had a profit with NHL two years ago, that's what you should have done. Hey, I'm figuring out, do I want to play cash? Do I want to play GPPs? I'm, this, things are starting to click. I'm starting to starting to get it. it you know, the, the pieces of the puzzle I don't feel like I'm just drowning anymore. I'm starting to learn how to swim a little bit in this thing. Your second year is exactly what it should look like. If you're doing what you're supposed to be doing that first year, having a five-figure profit in one season is exactly what you should be reaping the benefit from that. And the reason is, you know, again, if you're playing every day, you're getting those reps. I, I, I always like to talk about the Michael Phelps example. And I can't remember if this was on in Malcolm Glad. Uh, Gladwell's book Outliers, or if he was talking about it. But long story short, um, you know, people talk about what makes Michael Phelps so successful, and everyone just says, "Oh, well, he's tall, and you know, he's he's built for swimming." And I think someone asked him again. I, I can't remember the exact details of this story, so I apologize. But long story short, he was in the pool every single day for I think five to 10 years. So if his competition is only swimming Monday through Friday, he's picking up an extra two days of practice a year or a, a, a week. So over the course of the year, that's over 100 days. So if you're starting to play DFS January 1st, and your friend is starting to play DFS January 1st, and he's only gonna play on the weekends, you're playing every day, who's gonna stand to benefit more at the end of the year? So that's what you're doing. And that's what I mean by if you're doing everything just playing every day, and most people can't afford to play every day because they burn themselves out by putting too much money in play. So what you're going to be seeing now as you move into your third year this year, so before we talk, so before we get to that, how have the first couple of weeks of NHL gone for you? Um, they've been okay. Uh, a lot of break-even nights, some small profits, some small losses. This season, uh, in order for me to be able to go a little bit in higher stakes without risking so much, what I actually decided to do is to attack some low dollar satellites. So outside of my MME, I run with my crunch, I add, I don't know, 40, 50 entries into like 12 cents, 9 cents, a a dollar satellite, like uh, multiple entry. And with those, I'm able to cover to get into a higher entry GPPs that allow me to have other entries in the future. Um, so I, I've been attacking that. So my bankroll has taken a hit on that because of that mostly, but uh, I have, let's say next, next month, I already have like seven or eight tickets for the NHL super goal, I think on Fandle, which is something like what, almost 200 bucks. So. And that's that's a big deal. I think so much about DFS is just surviving to fight another day. You know, it. You say, "Hey, I won ten thousand dollars last season." I'd be willing to bet that most of the season, your you know small loss, small win, or breaking even, but you're coming back long enough to get those spikes. Is that a, is that an accurate assumption? Exactly. Like if if I get one or two. If I get a one takedown a week that can cover all my losses and profits, then it's a good week. 
And that's that's what's so crucial. With I, I just I just really commend you for what you're doing. You're you're absolutely going about this the right way. What you're what you're now doing in year three, you know, there's an adjustment with any season, any sport, no matter how successful we've been. NBA is my best sport. I'm super excited about it tonight, and I'm also not blowing smoke up my you know what, knowing that hey, I might not start off hot out the gates. You know, there might be some adjustments that I'm not accounting for right now that I need to be able to do. So. You know, just because you're feeling like you're breaking you in the first couple of weeks of hockey, the fact that you're showing up every single day and what you're doing is a year three player of collecting satellite tickets is exactly what you should be doing because it can be very intimidating to move up if you haven't had any practice in doing so. And I would highly encourage you when you get a chance to cash in those satellite tickets, don't do anything differently. Do exactly what you did to earn those tickets because I see so often we start out thinking, ourselves or yeah. oh testosterone's playing in this one and homercles and you know all of the guys that are that you know crush hockey on a on a year to year basis are, are playing in this tournament. Don't worry about that stuff. Just keep playing your own game. Now in terms of what you had talked about getting better at being contrarian, I think that that's something that in your third year you start to get a little a little bit more comfortable with. You know, your first couple of years you just don't want to look foolish. You know, we, we, we have that fear of missing out. We're playing it a little bit safer. And it's only with the reps in starting to aspire to those higher ceilings that you're willing to take some more chances. So I think in terms of chalk or contrarian, I think that people will put meaning behind those words. Oh, chalk is a bad thing. Contrarian is a good thing. They're neither. Those words are amoral. They're not good or bad. They're, they're how we use them. And I think that roster construction, so much of it is you know, understanding what you're trying to do. If you're going to have Sidney Crosby or Ovi or, or you know, McKinnon or whoever the chalk is, you, know, you might need to offset that with a lower own stack you know, a team that's not very good or not known for their offensive prowess like the Red Wings or, you know, a team like that. Um, one of my favorite things to do is look at who's been struggling lately. You know, if we see the Bruins have, you know, only scored one goal in the last week, I'm going to look to be playing the Bruins over the next week because if their season average is four goals a game, you know, or they are averaging four goals a game at home versus the road, that type of stuff matters. So I don't know what goes into your process in terms of doing your own research and looking at metrics. One of my favorite metrics to look at that I look at in every single sport is what is this team doing on the road? What is this team doing at home? You know, the environments are going to be different wherever you see, you know, you're not going to see as rapid as a fan base at a Phoenix Coyotes game versus a St. Louis Blues game. You know, that type of stuff matters. So I think when, you know, if, if you're searching for, hey, can I be, how can I be a little bit different uh, and get more contrarian, start looking at some of these home and away ices, some of the, you know, the goalie trends, um, you know, some of the, the, the lineup mixtures. If you're seeing a new guy on the first line or, hey, there, this guy got moved up to the power play one line. Um, you know, that's an opportunity for you to just go in there and say, hey, you know what? I, I see something that no one else is seeing. And I, I think so much about DFS. Um, ironically, we're talking about hockey. Wayne Gretzky always said, don't go where the puck is, go where it's going. So that's how we can get contrarian is thinking for ourselves and thinking about what are other people not looking at today? What are, what are people getting a little lazy about today? You know, is there somebody here that I can, I can go to that other people aren't really looking at? One of the things I see in every single DFS sport is there's a West Coast unbiased Everybody on the East Coast and the Midwest wants to see all their guys play before they go to sleep. A lot of these West Coast teams are going virtually unowned um, or not being played at all. I know that you know the, the Kings aren't really a high-scoring team, but if you're on you know, a 10-12 game slate and you're stacking the Kings late and they go for five goals, you know, you're probably looking at less than, I don't know, 3 to 7% ownership per guy. So I would just encourage you to – you're successful and you're, you're outside of uh, DFS, you know, so start looking at, you know, some of the things. If you're troubleshooting a problem for IT and you're noticing the same problem occurring over and over again, well, you would come up with a creative solution to eliminate that. And DFS is no different. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, there's always, there's also been a bunch of, of goalies that I've said that when they play in, in different arenas, because of the way the boards have the, the ads or, or painted or whatever, that they have difficulty seeing the puck. So what you're saying makes sense. And, and, and I hadn't really looked at it that way, I guess. See, and um, that's, that's, that's what's so important. There's so much about being successful at DFS has, has very little to do with, hey, you know, what about 
what about playing a 5-2 stack or a 4-4-2? Four, four, or it's just like, you know, that 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 can be very noisy. Whatever stack combination or stuff like that settings wise, that's gonna be up to you to determine based off of your back testing that I know you're doing in lineup rewind and stuff like that. But I just think yep. that, you know, you being in Canada, I don't think that a lot of the Canadian DFS players realize what an advantage that they have in terms of their hockey knowledge versus the um, American players that, you know, everything I know about hockey is stuff that I've had to teach myself the last couple of years um, playing <laughs> DFS. You know, I grew up rooting for Gretzky. You know, I was a big fan of those Kelly Hurley, Luke Robitaille, Kings teams. But since then, I haven't really followed hockey. So I'm operating at a, a pretty big disadvantage versus somebody like you that's like, oh, yeah, you know what? Um, when the Islanders, the, the road goalies really struggle because of X, Y, and Z. Now, that's a type of knowledge that you can really leverage that other people aren't seeing. And it's it's a, the, the thing that I think can really help us be better DFS players is just applying common sense to DFS where common sense isn't very common. So as you're looking at solving this complicated problem on a night to night basis, a lot of the times we want to make it more complicated. And what we should be striving to do is trying to make it simpler. Okay, you know, who are the four to five teams that I like? Who are the three to six goalies? Or however you're, you're whatever you're doing to divvy up your player pool is, is a, a great way to go about figuring out ways to be different based off of just the common sense that you're, you're thinking or hearing about, or, you know, one of the things that I have for every single sport is I have a, um, a Twitter list for every single team, including their beat reporters, fan blogs, fans. I just want a pulse of that team quickly. So that might help you in some of the areas to get an edge where information isn't as fluid in a sport like NHL. Um, I haven't been playing NHL this season, but in our staff um, Slack chat, some of the guys have been playing NHL, and I and I pop in there to just see how it's going. And I know the last couple of nights there's been, you know, uh, it's been horrible. Yeah, the news has been horrible. Like guys being scratched after being said that they're going to play, and ah, oh, man. And and you having a pulse on that is going to be huge because I guarantee I would anticipate. That especially on a site like FanDuel where you don't have the swap optimizer on Fantasy Cruncher like you do, it's going to be a lot more challenging for these guys. And um, I would also venture to guess that very f – I think we'd be surprised how many people are actually max entering that quarter contest on FanDuel. So that means that most of the people are only throwing in you know five to ten entries, maybe just one entry. And – if they don't care about it, especially with a sport like basketball starting, you know, we're going to have basketball, football, and hockey. That's a lot to juggle. So if you're focusing on hockey, these roster changes, a lot of these guys aren't doing. So I, I think there's a lot of advantage to put yourself in a position like we saw the other night with McKinnon. You know, if you're comfortable with swapping out guys if he's out, that can be a huge advantage of just being like, look, dude, I'm going to load up on McKinnon tonight. I, That's what I, did. <laughs> I, I expect him to play because it's so hard to adjust yeah. after the fact. If he does, And if he doesn't play, this is where the bankroll management comes into play where it's like, hey, you know what? Not my night. I, I, I made a gamble that I, I thought would pay off. It didn't pay off. And that's where our decision making needs to be put through um, a filter because if you made the decision and it didn't work out, but you would go back and ask yourself, hey, all things being equal, without hindsighting, would I make the same decision 100 out of 100 times? If the answer is yes, you made the right decision. You know, a lot of the times at DFS, I'll have somebody look up my roster construction on, you know, um, lineup study or whatever. And like this last past weekend in the NFL, I played 100% Tyler Boyd. And people are like, why did you play that much Tyler Boyd? And I it just, I liked the spot. He was, you know, um, his salary was lower than it had been. Uh, he had been disappointing. I thought it was an opportunity to take advantage of what we see in the NFL when wide receivers struggle. They normally get fed at some point. You know, the Jaguars had just lost Jalen Ramsey, so I thought we might be able to take advantage of Boyd in the slot. And it didn't work out, but you look at, okay, well, why did I make that decision? I thought that Dalton would have to throw 40 times more, okay? I thought that um, Boyd would be peppered with double-digit targets. So we go back and we look at, and see what happened. If that's what my basis was 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 factoring into why I went all in on Boyd, we can see, all right, well, Dalton threw 43 times. So my 40 attempts 
assumption or hypothesis or whatever was correct. I thought that Tyler Boyd would get over 10 targets. He had 12. Now, what we didn't think would happen is Alex Erickson having a career game, and he had 14 targets. I think he had six catches for 137 yards and 14 targets. It's like, all right, well, I was using Saber Sims' 75th percentile projection on Boyd, who had him at 25 points, and Erickson essentially had the game that Boyd had. So if somebody's just looking at that and said I made the wrong call, I'm not going to argue with them because it's a waste of time. But if I'm looking at that and asking myself, did I make the right decision? A hundred percent. And I'll go back to that again, you know? So I think whenever you're looking at your decisions and you can put it through the frame of, if I had to do this a hundred out of a hundred times, would the answer be yes? You're golden. And sometimes it might be, yeah, you know what? 90% of the time I would. You're still on the right side of the percentile of where you want to be. So I think that some of the things that you feel like might be holding you back I would just continue to explore and looking for those those edges of just other people being lazy. A lot of people just want to show up, download projections, hit calculate, and print money, and it doesn't work like that. You got to make adjustments. You got to massage some of the stuff. And really, more than anything, I I will. Sorry, I'm I'm losing you a bit. So I'm sorry. That's okay. What was the last thing that you heard? Um, hit calculate. Oh yeah, a lot of people just want to download the projections, hit calculate, and then print money. And it doesn't work like that. You know, you gotta you gotta make adjustments. And the number one thing that I will always, always, always encourage somebody, no matter where they're at in their their GFS journey, is think for yourself, man. Like I just I just think there's so much value in now that you know what you're doing, and now that you have the sample size that proves, hey, I'm a winning player. First of all, that's only 10% of the people that play DFS are winning players. And the fact that you have a five-figure winning season, like you're in that 10%. So now it's about, well, what can we do to take you that in that 10% and get you in the top five and get you in the top one? And, and most of those guys that are killing it at the top of the game, they're not worried about all the other crap that a lot of the players that are struggling are worried about. They, they know exactly what they're, they're going to do. They're showing up. They're executing. They're thinking for themselves. So, you know, the three core habits that make a successful player are, number one, putting in the work, what you're doing. Number two, bankroll management, what you're doing. And number three is the patience aspect. And that's all we're, we're going to be working on this season is, hey, you know what? I've been doing what I've been doing for a while. It's paying off. Maybe the season hasn't started as much as, as good as or as well as I would have liked it to have. But dude, you're a thousand percent on the right path. And I just think that getting that third year growth that you're aiming for, I think you're a lot closer than you think. Okay. It's good to know. <laughs> Uh, because sometimes right, you, we sit there and we're like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going in the right direction. Maybe it was I was just very lucky. Maybe I wasn't. Um, am I putting? Am I actually looking at the right things? You know, th things that we always ask ourselves um, when when reviewing, when rewinding, going on lineup study. Okay, looking at what other guys are doing, how they're attacking a the slate. There's different techniques, right? Some guys like to spread completely out. Some guys like to have a really tight core, uh, depending on the sport. And it's funny because I actually started playing NHL once I kind of realized I wasn't good at NBA, even though I love the sport and I played it for a good amount of years. Um, I feel that NBA is there's so little edge, like everyone uses probably the same stuff. Um, and uh, for me, it was, I guess, maybe too much work to be put, to have to put in, to be able to actually enjoy it. But MME-wise, I haven't played NBA, and, and I, I wasn't planning on playing this season, just because, again, I, I feel it's a lot of work that I have to put in, besides the work I already put into NHL. But if you have any suggestions, places where I should start to look at, um, I'm open to suggestions so that's a great question so the first thing i'll suggest is number one you gotta you gotta do and you gotta play the games that you're excited about you know the um, i think enthusiasm is such an important quality to listen to um, the etymology of the word enthusiasm uh, is from god so i feel like when you're feeling that excitement that's god or the universe or whatever you believe in pointing you in the right direction and you know Part of the reason I'm not playing NHL this year is 
I just wasn't fired up about it. You know, I had a great baseball season. I was feeling kind of burnt out. We're moving back to California. I was struggling my ass off with football, and it was just too much. And I was like, I just need a little time off to get ready for NBA. So anytime a new sport pops up, you know, everyone's excited about it, and we can feel pressure to play it. If you're not feeling it, don't play it. You know, I think that that's one of the worst things that we can do is feel obligated to play something. And if you are excited about it, just hop in some place that's not going to ruin you. You know, one of the mistakes I made three times already this NFL season is putting in the same kind of volume that I do for baseball and basketball. And it's like, dude, I don't, I can't justify that kind of decision without the sample size and the amount of success that I've had in the other two sports. So what I've done is force myself to just be on a budget. I'm not going to play more than X amount of dollars per week at football. That's it. It's enough money to make it interesting. It's enough money that, hey, you know what, this was fun. I learned something. I'm getting better. But it's not enough to where I lose sleep over. And even though I encourage people all the time with good bankroll management skills, like I still screw up a lot. And I had three really big losing weeks. And what I did from a, a game selection and roster construction wasn't the problem. It was a bankroll management. I had way too much money in play. And it's funny, we think, I think there's just something internally about when we think about putting more money in play, we think that that's magically going to make us better players. And it actually has that complete opposite effect. Yeah, so. the opposite. Effect. <laughs> so I think you quickly that, realize, oh, I shouldn't have them. Oh my gosh, man. It's like you're, you're, you're getting your money in and you see all the money you have to play. And you're like, dude, if I just double up, I'm going to be like, I'm going to cover all my overhead this month in, in one day. And then the game start and the money that you're excited about in play and nothing's moving. You're just like, oh my gosh, what I, I just made a huge mistake. And then it's just like agony the rest of the day watching the money not move and you're losing money. And there's like one day it's like, I shouldn't be putting myself in a position to lose a month's worth of rent in one day. That's just very, very foolish and very, very irresponsible regardless of you know how confident I'm feeling. So with that said, if you're interested and you're feeling excited about NBA, I think the game on on DraftKings is is better for a beginning player simply because you can get in the dime times. Uh, there's a lot of satellites. You can get you know 150 entries of volume for you know 15 bucks. It's not gonna it's not gonna break the bank. You don't have to do that many entries. You can start with a couple dime times. I always recommend people. Hey, you know what? If you're learning something, just start with three to five dime times. You know, it's gonna be six to ten dollars. It's not gonna you know. It, it, it just look at it as entertainment value. Hey, I'm going to bring my lunch to work tomorrow and then play six to $10 a dime times. So, you know, there's a ways to massage your budget to make it work. Um, and I think that the thing that separates DraftKings that I like more about DraftKings than FanDuel is you will have guys that will have multi-position eligibility. Like for instance, you can play LeBron tonight at point guard or power forward or LeBron at guard okay. or forward. So there's some flexibility that allows the roster construction to be a little bit different than looking at, you know, FanDuel where you can only play one center and, and like, oh, do I play Derek Favors tonight? Do I play Pau Gasol or do I pay up for Anthony Davis? You just have to make more decisions that can be uh, less forgiving on FanDuel than on DraftKings. Um, so DraftKings NBA has been my bread and butter, but I'm going to learn on the other sites. I'm feeling excited about trying to learn on the other sites. I'm going to start very, very small. I'm not going to put nearly uh, anywhere near the amount of volume on the other three sites that I'm going to put on DraftKings. But I think that the thing that's really fun with DraftKings, with somebody that's an experienced fantasy cruncher user like yourself is being able to use the late swap optimizer. Like that is such an awesome tool and you could set it up to where you get your hockey lineups done. So like tonight it's perfect. There's a four o'clock hockey's at four o'clock. I, I say Pacific time. I don't know what time your you're time. On. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 okay. So we'll say seven o'clock your time, but then basketball is not till eight o'clock. So you have a full hour to do stuff. And you know, we know that there's not as much lineup adjusting that needs to go on for hockey. So you could always, you know, set up your hockey lineups and then after hockey lock is done, you just because the game locks at seven o'clock for NBA doesn't mean you have to play those games. You could put your dummy lineups to include all the guys that start at the ten o'clock games, and then you can start building your NBA lineups once NHL is locked with the seven thirty, eight o'clock games on the NBA. And that already is a way that you're going to be different than anybody else. So I'd encourage you, if, if you are thinking about balancing them, first of all, be excited about it. If you're not excited about it, don't force it. Don't do it. You know, I, I've tried so hard to figure out these showdown slates, 
and I just can't do it anymore. I'm, I'm just losing my enthusiasm over it, and I'm probably going to do a couple more, and then I'm done. You know, basketball, I'm trying to save. This is my last season with lower stakes eligibility on DraftKings, so I'm not going to play the NBA showdowns. I wasn't as profitable in them as I was in the classic style games or the micro boosters, the winner take alls. So I think it just comes down to, like, you know, what – what are you excited about? If you love the NBA, you know, like, hey, I'm just gonna do two. I'm just gonna do a dime time for two bucks and build twenty lineups and see how I do. It's an awesome way to learn. It's an awesome way to stay yeah, engaged probably, on I'll a product that you that like. Way. Yeah, it's uh, those dime time tournaments. I wish I had those when I was coming up because those are such incredible tools to learn and experiment and do all sorts of crazy stuff. And if it burns you, who cares? It's two dollars. Your life's not gonna be affected by $2. And if it is, you shouldn't be playing DFS. And when I say that, I'm not meeting you. I'm meeting anybody that's going to listen to this. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, for sure. I'm, I'm, I'm every, every year NBA starts, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Cause I, when I first started playing DFS, I actually stumbled upon fantasy guru elite. Again, no affiliation, no affiliation. Um, I had some time there. I, after a certain point, I kind of felt, it wasn't really my my style of, of what they were doing, so I decided to to go on my own path. I had ran into some guys in, in their in their Slack and whatever, and we started our own little group, and we talk every sport, right? So we were talking NBA and this and that, and and you know we, we play every year NBA, NHL, NFL, uh, tennis, esports, whatever you want, we, we play. It. Um, but. I had lost a lot of enthusiasm in, into NBA because I was like, hey, I wasn't being profitable and I was probably playing over what I should have been playing, knowing that I wasn't having the success I wanted. And that's, that's, that's going to be the case for anybody across the board. The number one thing that prevents players from winning at DFS more than anything else is fear. Whenever I'm working with a player that's struggling, I can guarantee that I can diagnose the thing that they're struggling with is related to fear. Whether that's fear of missing out, too much money in play, you know, there um, a lot of guys won't not play and instead spend that time putting in the work, again, because of fear of missing out. There's just so many things related to fear that can, can burn you out, and we find ourselves like continually playing these things and trying to fit, uh, you know, a square peg into a round hole kind of a thing. And like I agree with you, man. Like NASCAR, there's people that are like are fired up and love NASCAR and golf and MMA. And my brain just doesn't work well with those sports. I just can't wrap my mind around it. And every single year, I would just get like more and more discouraged and harder and harder on myself and force myself to learn. And it's like, what am I doing? This sucks. I don't like this at all. Why? Why am I? Why am I forcing myself to? This just doesn't make any sense. And it's like you know what, John, like you can stop. Like no one is forcing you to play these games. And it was almost like, yeah, I can stop. And then I just stopped. And now I don't worry about it. Now I don't care. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. It's, it's something special. Um, <laughs> every sport I'm like, no, I shouldn't play this. And I, and I play it. Uh, <laughs> and that's okay. Like, and that's where, you know, we, um, you know, before DFS, I, I, I did a lot of sports betting and my, my friend and I, you know, we would talk about all the games all day long and there would just be like, you know, Thursday night football, you know, or like the world series. It's like, I don't really have an educated opinion on, you know, the world series game tonight, but there's nothing wrong with throwing a lunch money bet on it. Like we, we would call them lunch money bets, five to 10 bucks just to like have a rooting interest. It's like, okay. There's nothing wrong with throwing five to ten bucks on on a sport just to screw around and have some fun, and a lot of the times that can be really good for our our, our mental um, capacity. Is sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves in these sports that we do really well in at that sometimes it's just good to screw around and remember that this game is supposed to be fun and it's you know not as serious as we can make it out to be. And sometimes you know not taking something as seriously frees us up to play a little bit looser. You know how often do you see? Um, these guys, you know, in a sport like baseball or basketball or even hockey where, you know, it's a six, you know, a five to seven game series and that night, you know, the team just comes out tight and they lose and the next game they don't really have anything to lose and they play a lot looser and then they, they, they play their best, you know, uh, that they have all year. And DFS is very, very similar, man. So much about – so much that goes into winning at DFS is just applying universal principles that are – always true to DFS, you know, are you more likely to, I'm sorry, hang on a second. No problem. It's okay, bud. 
Are you more likely to do well at something when you're having fun or are you more well to do something, you know, when you're nervous or anxious or frustrated by it, you know? Yeah, when, when you lose that, that fun part of, of actually playing the DFS game, because I ran into that when once I, once I was losing money in NBA and MLB, I was like, you know what, I'm not having fun. I was, I was con contemplating retirement. But then I started, you know what, going back to really low stakes, just building stuff, hitting my head against the wall, but actually having fun trying new stuff, right? And, and that's where I was like, okay, no, I can't leave. Not because I can't stop. I can stop tomorrow morning, but it's just the fun of it, right? I'm sitting there, I'm watching the game. Might as well have some side action just to add a little bit more fun to it. And, and that, that's how I do for pretty much every sport I, I play on. A thousand percent. I'm working on something right now for NBA. And I was talking to my buddy who I talked to about DFS a lot. And I was like, this project is taking me so much time. And he's like, well, then why do it? And I was like, well, number one, if I'm building this project, only I will have access to it. So I'm going to, if it works, I'm going to have a potential amount of edge. And number two, I'm having a blast putting all the research together. Cause it's like, dude, if this, if, if what I think can happen from what I'm doing, we could reach that next level of, of where we want to get to. And I think so much about what makes you better at DFS and you trying to hit that third gear this year, fourth gear, whatever you want to call it, is exactly that, is getting to that place of childlike wonderment and enthusiasm. You know, kids aren't worried about bills and stressing out. They're just on the playground having fun all day, you know? And that's the same type of attitude that we need to have towards DFS where it's like, hey, you know what? Like I'm experimenting with something in football right now that I don't talk to anybody about because everybody will tell me that that is the wrong way to do it. But it's like, well, I understand what you're saying, but every time I'm working on my roster construction, when I do it this way, it's outperforming the lineups that I build when everyone tells me I should do it that way. So I'm not trying to be a stubborn a-hole about it. I'm just curious because I just think at some point, especially in DFS, we need to be aware of when the landscape change, do we want to be an early adopter, an adopter, or a late adopter when things change? The reason a lot of these guys that we saw a couple of years ago aren't around anymore is they're just stubborn. They weren't willing yep. to change. They weren't willing to adjust. So I think that, you know, just when you are feeling burnt out, take some time off. Let that enthusiasm come back. Make sure you're getting your rest, man, because that is running a DFS business on the side and having a full-time gig and you have, you know, your family and friends and social uh, time commitments that are, that are just take a break. You know, this, this thing is so rewarding, but if we put it on a pedestal and, and start worshiping, worshiping it like an idol, it'll eat us alive. So oh, for sure, for sure. We gotta I've, I've had to take break. Yeah. And that's, and, and, and that's so smart, man. I just, and everything I hear from you, I just think too, like you're so, so close to just exploding into that, you know, next level and being, you know, hitting that next gear where you're just like, dude, now I'm, now I'm really cooking. Cause I think a lot of the times we can battle confidence issues also. Like I still struggle with that. Like I'll see, you know, something that is undeniable about the type of DFS player that I am. And then I'll start comparing myself to someone else and I'll feel like crap about it. So we, it's a mental battle. So much of this is mental more than anything else. And if we're not in the right headspace, we're not rested properly, you know, we're, we're putting too much pressure on this thing to do well, it's not going to go well. You know, if a car is not going to start, you know, slamming on the gas to get it to start is not going to make it start. You know, we need to get out of the car, pop the hood, call an expert, reset, and then we can start making some progress. Yep, yep. No, I totally agree. And 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 yeah, no, because there was a certain point where I was giving it too much too much importance in my life and you know, I, I had to stop going out and this and that because I had to do lineups and, and I, I I real I quickly realized I was being a, a completely absorbed and I was like, Okay, this is not what I started this for. I wanted to have fun, make some side money and so I had taken a couple of months break just enjoy watching tv you know spending some time with the family with the girlfriend and whatnot and wh when i came back was actually uh i, I had taken uh, some time off of mlb last not this year that that's finishing but last year and then i jumped into nhl with a clean slate right with a right head face thing like okay let me take a look of what i can do better how i can improve and this and that and and i got the year i got but Again, like you say, when, when, when you compare yourself to others, that's when it starts 
<laughs> when that's when it starts getting complicated because um, that's what that's where I sit and I'm like maybe I got lucky you know maybe the the, the 10k wasn't based on on the knowledge I had gained but more I got lucky that night right but sometimes I tell myself there's also human aspect in what we do like the the the, the things we're betting on there's there's humans behind it and we can't control that aspect and I feel that once I accepted the fact that there's things that you can't control. It kind of gets easier of just building your stuff, trusting what you're doing, and if it doesn't work out, hey man, it didn't work out. What can I say? Well, and that's that's I mean that's really you know a great way to look at it. You know, one of the things I'm really excited about with like this NBA project is there's going to be so much heavy lifting for me this first month that I'm not going to have a lot of time to watch the games. Like that is so good for me to not have to sweat these games because. That's one of the things I'm trying to get better at myself is I can only control so much and me staring at my phone. So I'll check my phone. Like I'll check, check like the DraftKings app, like once every three minutes and it takes like 30 seconds over like a six or seven hour period. Like how much time am I wasting by just checking something I have absolutely no control over? So that's one of the things that I'm trying to get better myself is like, dude, once everything is done, you know, I think one of the things I'm going to try to do better this year with NBA is after that last game locks, shut everything down. Either start working on stuff for the next day, go for a walk, you know, hang out with my wife and dogs or go to the beach, whatever I need to do, anything but sweat this crap, thinking that the more I hit refresh, the more money I'm going to win, you know? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And and that's something I, I kind of told my girlfriend that I was going to start doing more is, yeah, once everything locks, a close my phone or close my app and, and just spend some time with her and even with my family. Well, and that's key because the, the, the better you get at this, the more you're going to want and need that family support. So if you're, again, keeping everything in the right perspective, number one, you can justify it because you've earned enough to show that, hey, this is like, you know, having a second job. But number two, you know, the just having that balance and in, in, it's just crazy, man. Like, I don't know what's going on in my 401k. I don't it doesn't matter. So I don't know why I just know at the end of, you know, when I need it one day, it'll be larger than it is now. And I don't stress on it, but like I'll lose any amount on DFS and I'll just start spiraling mentally about if I have a bad DFS run, like I can tell you within three weeks, like how I'm going to be homeless. Like that's how much like things can spiral out of control mentally. And we just got to just get better at, you know, just staying in the pocket, showing up every day, putting in that work, keeping that balance and, you know, just enjoying it because yeah, this thing is so much more fun when you're just like, like today it's Christmas morning, you know, NBA. I'm so excited. Next seven months of my life are, are that much better because of this thing that I have, but it needs to be a thing in my life, not the thing in my life. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I completely agree. So talk to um, me about your your days off schedule. Are you taking any days off? Because I think that that might be something that could could open up some some breakthroughs for you as well. Give me just a sec. Uh, can, are you listening? The guy passing the the what's it called the vacuum? Do you hear? Him? Mm, I'd have to listen really closely. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, we're I good. just want to make sure. Yeah, no, so we're can good. you go back again to your question? Oh yeah, I was just saying. Um, are you playing every day? Taking any days off? What What does that look like? Um, because it's NFL season. Well, I play Sundays. I play pretty much every day of the week, from Monday to Friday nights NHL. Um, so yeah, I kind of take like very very little days off. Unless, let's say on a Wednesday night, there's like a two game where I'm like, oh, I'm not going to play that. Um, <laughs> or I'm going to put like a, a $5 buy-in in a single entry and just close my laptop and come back the next day. Um, but yeah, basically, I'm almost playing every day. Um, but for me, NHL is fun, right? I, I, I have a lot of fun doing it, so it's not like a burden. So I think I think that's the number one thing that I would recommend is is continue doing what you're doing. If it stops not feeling fun or, or starts not feeling fun, don't do it. Um, I think one of the other things that can really affect us negatively is if we're not feeling like playing and we end up, we're hey, day before I'm taking tomorrow off and then we end up talking ourselves into playing. 
most of the time that's going to go poorly because <laughs> yeah. there's not there's not a lot of upside to it because it's like if I won, uh, okay, good. But if I lose, now I'm double pissed because I wasn't going to play, and now you know that rabbit hole spirals in, in the negative direction more so than it should have been. So I would encourage you just to keep doing what you're doing. The other thing too that I've started to do more of is Saturday we have a really big family event and it's prime NBA season. You know, I was going to make Thursday as my day off for NBA, but it's like, you know what? I'm not doing anything on Thursday. I have a lot to do on Saturday, so I'm just going to play on Thursday and not play on Saturday. You know, I remember like my sister got married last year and I'm doing NBA lineups or trying to take like family photos and stuff. I'm like, what am I doing? Like, this is so stupid. Yeah. And I, and I, 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 I probably made like 200 bucks, but there was another night I went to a Christmas party and I lost 500 bucks. So it's like days off. I think it's hard because we think we're missing. Oh, this is the day that I'm going to hit five figures or six figures and change my life. Now, chances are it's, you're going to lose, you know, most GPP players, you know, I lose probably six to seven slates that I play. So statistically, I'm probably losing. So every day I take off, I'm actually probably putting more money into my pocket. And it's just kind of a wash. Some days you're going to win. Some days you would have lost. Who cares, you know? But stay, staying fresh to play your best game and live your best life, you know, that's way more valuable than trying to force the action. No, for sure, for sure. Yeah, if, if I have to convince myself to play, I know it's not the, it's not the right time to do it. <laughs> Every no, time I've done it, it's, it's gone poorly. Not at um, all. So I have a question for you. Yeah. So let's say, okay, tonight maybe is, is probably the worst time to start playing NBA because I have done zero research, but it's a two-game slate, right? Right. Um, what are the top, let's say, three things I should pay attention to when playing NBA DFS? It's a great question. So the two things that are most important are going to be the minutes, Minutes are the currency in NBA DFS, you know, the equivalent of time on the ice for, for NHL. We want guys that are going to be on the court a lot. And there's three types. So I look at NBA players. There's three types of players. There's a gold player, a silver player, and a bronze player. A gold player is anybody that's going to get 28 minutes or more. 28 minutes There's 48 minutes. In an NBA game, so 28 minutes. Those are typically the guys that are going to be on the floor for at least three three quarters. So we know that 75% of the time, this guy is going to be on the court. The next tier, the silver tier, these are guys that are going to play 23 to 28 minutes. So these guys are going to be on the court about half of the game. These guys are going to be pretty important, and this is the the type of player that most players aren't really looking to go towards because they're not really known, they're not superstars, they're not sexy, some of them might be backups, but the silver tier is where we're going to make a lot of money. The third tier is bronze. This is anybody getting under 23 minutes. These are guys that are going to be you know, backups. Um, not a lot of them are going to have value on a night like tonight. We're going to have to dip into the bronze category to try to win. Um, but what we want to take a look at with those three things is building our lineups with more gold and silver players. I think it's really beneficial to have a lot of silver players. A lot of times what people want to do is jam in as many gold players as they can, and then they'll filter in the bronze guys. And you're really limiting your, your upside with that. So it's like take a game like tonight on DraftKings. You could fit in LeBron, Anthony Davis, and Kawhi Leonard and still have $4,000 of salary left. Well, everybody's going to try to do that. The, 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 yeah, they're, they're, everyone's going to have the same roster construction for sure. Exactly. So by thinking for ourselves, what can we do differently? So one of the things I'm going to be looking at tonight is, well, what can I do to build around some of these silver guys that you know aren't the big names but are going to get the same kind of minutes and have the same kind of ceiling, and I can afford more of them over this backup guard who's only going to see 12 minutes kind of a thing. You know, I think a lot of the times when people are using players from the bronze category, they're just hoping that a guy that's normally getting 12 minutes will miraculously get 23 minutes. And it's like, it's not how you use the bronze players. You use the bronze players when we know for sure they're going to get more minutes or if there's a clear path to them getting more playing time with the rotation you know, being tighter than normal. We're not going to see a lot of tight rotations at the beginning of the year. There's not going to be a lot of guys resting. There's not going to be a lot of guys on minute restrictions. So I, you can you can fire a lot of these guys in the gold and silver with with the most confidence and not pay too much attention to the guys that are in the bronze category. Now, the thing that separates each player per category is the usage stat. 
usage is pretty much a stat. And this is the second most important thing for me is when they're on the court, what are they doing? You know, are they involved? Are they getting rebounds? Are they touching the ball? Are they getting free throws? What we don't want are the guys that are, you know, the three and D guys that are just going to play defense and then stand in the corner offensively. offensively. Not to say that those guys don't have value because they can lead to winning rosters. We just want to make sure that they're in about 10% of our lineups and not 30%. So what I try to look at is, okay, when these guys are on the floor, I want to get them on the floor as much as possible. And when they're on the floor, are they actually doing something? Because that's going to help us determine how we go about building. So if you have a guy like, let's say a guy like Enos Cantor, he's probably going to play. He's probably going to play a little bit more minutes this year for the Celtics because he's their starting center. But last year when he was a backup center, you know, he would probably get about 22 minutes. But he's a guy that could easily get to 32 minutes because Nurkic gets into foul trouble. So now I have this guy in the silver category that is potentially going to be, let's say they're playing the Rockets and he's got to defend a really good center, uh, a really good offensive center like Clint Capella. Well, Nurkic could get into foul trouble easily, and all of a sudden we have Cantor, who normally plays 22 minutes, you know, playing 34 minutes, and that guy is a usage monster offensively. That guy will double-double in his sleep. Those are some of the things that we need to be looking at in terms of, you know, if we're going to go down in salary, let's be intentional about it. Let's not just throw this backup guard in because he had, you know, a lot of people just, you know, they'll, they'll box score watch. Oh, DJ Augustine had 40 points uh, last game and he's the starting point guard for the Magic, so he's going to do 40 points again. It's like, well, you know, what was the context? You know, were they playing with a shorter rotation? Did someone else get hurt or in foul trouble? You know, this guy that normally gets 16 DraftKings points, what led to him getting 40 points? Because we're not – it's safe to say he's probably not going back to 40 points. And that leads me to the third thing that I look at. I always want to keep my eye on the players that we know are good but have been struggling. Because every time they struggle, their salary is going down. And when their salary goes down, that means that they probably burnt other players who are going to be less inclined to go back to those players that have burnt them, resulting in huge leverage opportunities because all of a sudden a guy that should be owned at 30% is now owned at 6%. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have that guy in my lineup uh, to the point that it makes sense. So if a guy should be in the lineup at 30%, but everyone's scared, again, because fear is playing a factor, is not going to play that guy, and the field's only going to have him at 5%, and my numbers show that he should play at 30% where he should be, I'm going to play him at 30%. And if he burns me, guess what? Go back to our Tyler Boyd example. I'm going to do it again. And I just keep going back to this stuff. It doesn't. I don't have an ego about this stuff. I don't have a vendetta. I don't have, well, there's obviously players that burn you and you feel it, but if the number's called to play that number, to call that, to, the numbers call to play that team or that player or whatever, you just got to go back to it. I just think that, you know, a lot of the times people want more professional results than they do amateur stuff like, oh, Kyle Lowry burned me. It's like, you don't know that dude. He didn't purposely do that. Guy had a thumb injury or whatever, or he got into foul trouble or, you know, or they're trying some new rotations. They just take it so personally, you know? So it's just like. Yeah. We're all it, sitting behind our computers thinking we're professional athletes. But that, that's my 10-minute crash course on NBA is focus on guys that we know are going to be on the floor. Start looking at some of those guys that are in the mid-tier silver range value-wise that no one else is thinking about. Or if you can get a guy in the gold category that's priced down, that's that's where I would be looking at. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. And now you're cooking with – that's a really good strategy. And that's why people are like, hey, are you going to do any NBA content? And it's like, ah, I don't know because – what I just gave you is like 90% of the puzzle. So, <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, man. But yeah, I think you're, dude, you're, you're so far on the right path. You've already got a big-time winning season under your belt. And now it's just about you know continuing to check your ego like you have been, uh, staying a student of the game while keeping it fun. You know, If you can continue to master those three things, I mean, sky's the limit, man. There's nothing special about the guys that are top of the hockey game, any different – from you other than they've probably been doing it longer that's it yeah but th- that's kind of the way i see that i'm you know i'm just trying to still uh, to always get better right to, to always renew myself to always go back to what i'm doing making sure it's, it's correct um and actually this season i kind of changed a little bit my style of play when when playing nhl and uh i've actually 
have a lot less lows than 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 last season. Um, like I'll give an example. I've broken even almost every slate and slight profit, but last season would be either I would make profit or lose like 70% of my money. Mm -hmm. And right now maybe I'm losing maybe 10%, 15% and winning uh, 40% the next day. So for me, maybe that's where I feel like right now, maybe adjusting myself was a good thing, right? Because I'm having a lot less lows than I used to. I totally agree with you. I mean, that's, I, I don't have a lot of big caches. I'm just very, very consistent. And I think that people undervalue what you just described. I would much rather lose $10 a night, you know, three nights in a row and then win a hundred on that fourth night. than you know, lose 60, lose 60, you know, lose another 60 and then you win 120. It's like, well, you're still net negative. So I think whatever you've done to limit your floor while not really reducing your ceiling. I mean, so much of this game is protecting ourselves from taking massive losses. You know, I, you said I lost 10% or 15%. Those are wins in my book. This thing can go so terribly so fast, especially as a GPP player that anytime you take anything below a 30% loss, you know, rake is 10 to 15%. So you lost 10 to 15% plus rake, big deal. You know, you're coming back again tomorrow with a very healthy bankroll because you didn't overextend yourself. So, you know, I think that that's one of the, a lot of people are chasing these big time tournament binks. And I'm just like, you know, they're, they're trying so hard to get an A plus, And a lot of the times they get actually get an F. I'm just trying to sit in the back of the class, observe, and just consistently get my B plus. You know, sometimes I'll get an A. Sometimes I'll get a C, but I don't have a lot of D's and F's. The more D's and F's I can avoid, you know, we're going to be able to come back and play this game a lot longer because we're living to see another day. And every day you show up is a day that you can learn. And I just think that, you know, going back to our Michael Phelps example, the more that we show up, we're just going to learn more organically just from doing it every single day than the people that, you know, only show up and play one sport a year. I already know that, you know, the best hockey player in the world is having a terrible season. Well, why is that? I have some assumptions yeah. that I can make, but I guarantee that if this person were playing every single day and putting in the work like we are as daily grinders, he'd probably be doing, she would probably be doing a lot better, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, you know, making assumptions and that can get you in trouble, but that would be my hypothesis as why this person is struggling. So oh, just, for sure. Just, but just if, if we look doing. at, yeah, but if we look at my NFL this season, it hasn't been that pretty. <laughs> And that's it's okay. Been, and that's okay. But that's that's where playing the dimes and, and keeping it small is. Yeah, for sure. I, what I do for basketball, I was able to apply to baseball, and now I'm trying to apply it to football. And there's just it. it I know it sounds weird to completely different sports, but there's just certain things you start to pick up, and you're like, wait a second, that answer was right in front of my face. I do it all the time for this other sport. Why couldn't I do it here? And it just I just going back universal principles. I don't know why it works. It just works. You know. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and the, we, we, we tend to, the thing is, uh, I feel in this industry, there's so many content providers that people start thinking in, in masses. So often it's like, okay, this person has the, the, the answer or this person has the answer. In reality, I think no one really has it. We all, we all have our own ways of looking at, at things like anything in the world. Right. So I think we we all should start, like you say, to think a lot more by ourselves and not necessarily. I don't say don't listen to people, right? Because because you know I follow people, I I follow you, I follow Manny Laura and a bunch of people, but I always take what people give me and then I put in my own vision into it, and then it's like okay, what can I mix and match of everything, and and from there go. So that might be something else to to consider is you know with the daily average because it is an aggregate you know a lot of people like the wisdom of the crowd i don't i don't think the wisdom of the crowd is as powerful as it's made out to be and i think we see this all the time in decisions that people make just look at you know las vegas and the casinos that are taking sports bets they're not keeping all those bright lights on because the wisdom of the crowd is right they're keeping all those lights on because the wisdom of the crowd is so so bad 
You know, there's a saying, the masses are asses. So what might help you, and again, I don't want to discourage you or talk you off of anything that's already working, but you as an owner of your DFS business has to make this decision. It might make sense looking at a projection system like SaberSim that I know is really good, that is really good for hockey, that's actually going to put you on stuff that is going to be different regardless of what everyone else does. You know, So a site like the Daily Average is taking an aggregate of everything, but the problem with an aggregate of everything, it's taking into consideration the sites that aren't good also. And that could be something that's holding you up as well. Um, Daily Roto also has a really good hockey product. I just like Saber Sims more because it's computer-based, it's simulation-based, there's no human element into it, and they also do projections on Sunday, and a lot of the, the projection sites for NHL do not. So... I used to 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 have uh, Saber Sim. The thing is, I was just I, I I liked their product, but it was more maybe me not understanding properly how to use the percentiles and and if to go let's say let's go back to MLB right because I, I discovered I, I I used them a little bit for MLB. It was more should I go on a team basis on a player basis? What percentile should I go? And, and maybe if you can clear those, those things out for me, that would be appreciated. Not not necessarily telling me, oh, you have to go 75 for X, Y, Z reason, but just what the percentiles mean exactly and, and how to attack them and how to look at them. Yeah, so that's a great question. So one of the things that um, I know a lot of players like doing, and this is something that works really well for me as well, is on Fantasy Cruncher, you can load up and, and create additional columns. So I, I, never, I never play teams. I never play players. I only play numbers. So what I mean by that is when I'm doing my research, when I'm thinking for myself, I let the numbers tell me where to go. So once I do that, the numbers put me on the teams. And then once I'm in the teams, I let the numbers dictate what players that I'm going to be on. So let's say you're looking at a scenario where uh, you're going to be on, um, you know, your research puts you on the avalanche tonight. And it's like, okay, so I have, I'll, I'm going to load up all of the, I'm going to ro- load up the, the median projections. And all the median projection means is they're, they're going to simulate every single game 10,000 times. So 50% of the time, the median projection is going to be whatever that value ends up being. So let's say McKinnon is projected for 8.5 points. 50% of the time, but you like McKinnon a lot. Well, what you can do is you can load up the 75th percentile after adding an additional column on Fantasy Cruncher, and then you can just manually adjust. Oh, so McKinnon 75, 75th percentile is going to score you know 15 points. So that's what you use as your projection. So now you're going to get more McKinnon organically. That's actually based off of numbers, not gut. And what you're going to be able to then see is, okay, so what does the 75th percentile projection mean? Well, all you need to do to understand that is subtract whatever the percentile number is from 100. So the 75th percentile is saying 100 minus 75 is 25. So 25% of the time, McKinnon is going to have this game. And that's really what we want in DFS. We don't want the guys, we don't really care too much about what they're going to do on average. We want to find the guys that are going to have that 25%, that ceiling game, that top 5%, that top 1%, that career game. We just saw it on Sunday. Marvin Jones, I think Marvin Jones scored four touchdowns at all last year. He had four in one game. That's what we're trying to find with DFS. If you can figure out, like play DFS detective and try to figure out the clues that lead to these 25%, you know, games, these ceiling games, that's what the best in the world are doing. So yeah, I would highly, highly, highly recommend load up the, the Saberson projections as the median to set your baseline, start running some crunches to see who they like, and then you can make your manual adjustments of what your numbers tell you, what you should like more based off of, you know, putting in the percentiles or making some manual adjustments or, or doing or capping some of the goalie exposures or whatever, some of the stuff that you're already comfortable with and doing on Fantasy Cruncher. I actually don't cap anything. You'd be surprised. And that's, and that's, and that's totally cool. <laughs> I, I, it's funny. I don't except for in baseball cap pitching. But, yeah, some players love capping. And that goes back to what you're saying is some players like to play loose. Some players like to play with a tight core. It's a, it, DFS is a math problem. There's multiple answers to solving the problem. It's just, hey, how do you want to solve this? Do you want to use Excel to solve it, or do you want to use a calculator? Some people still like doing math by hand. It's 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 all relative. You can all solve the problem. It's just a matter of what you're you're most comfortable with. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I I would highly highly recommend. And Saberson doesn't pay me. I'm not on the payroll. I I just really appreciate. I'm, a, I'm just a big time fanboy of their product. Their product has literally changed my life in terms of what it's really helped my DFS results. I got four times 
what I did last year for baseball, I did four times better this year because of using Saber Sim. I never really had a big NFL day. I did that in week four because of Saber Sim. So, you know, I'm just combining the math and the tools that people that have way more money and way more smarts than I do that have built this incredible product and leveraging that to, well, what am I good at? I'm good at common sense. I'm good at game theory. Okay. Just combining their strength with my strength. And that's what's led me to be, you know, uh, a very good player at this. So, For sure. And I have one last question because yeah, I know sure. we've gone through, through our whole hour. Um, you know, earlier you were talking about, you know, look at struggling teams, players, and, and whatnot. How would you apply the percentiles to, to those players? If, if you feel it's too much of a direct question of what you do, you don't need to answer. But it, it's more... How would you attack it? Would you go more to the extent of, of staying to his, to his median projection or going higher? So that's a great question. So you can actually have the, the best of both worlds. So on Fantasy Cruncher, any, any correlated sport, hockey, baseball, football, I built one team at a time. So this last week, um, Josh Allen was my, was my top quarterback. So I built all my Josh, lineup, Josh Allen lineups first. Then it was Aaron Rodgers, and I built all my Aaron Rodgers lineup second. So I think sometimes it can be a challenge to build 150 lineups at a time just off of settings or groups or whatever. The only sport I do that for is basketball. So in terms of what to do for hockey, I'd recommend let your research put you on the teams. And you know if you're going to load up the Calgary Flames tonight, you're already locking in the Flames by using the stacking tool on Fantasy Cruncher. So what we yep. want to consider is – what are our one-offs doing? Are we just going to trust the projections for them? Or is that where I'm going to give McKinnon a 75th percentile bump? So now I have Flames plus McKinnon, and then I have a group to include McKinnon plus you know one of his forwards. Now you're cooking with some, some real firepower and playing this game differently and creating a huge opportunity to create a huge ceiling and leverage by just by thinking for yourself and making a couple adjustments. Again, most people aren't thinking for themselves. They're just trusting the projections, hitting the calculate button, and hoping they get lucky. Okay. Okay. I, I, I understand where you want to go. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, perfectly. Cool. All right. Uh, I think we covered everything, right? Awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. Um, I, we've had a couple of interactions on Twitter and email, and I 100% want to hear about how things are going for you. Email is always the best way to get in touch with me, so feel free to hit me up on email. I always answer emails. It stays in my inbox until I've got back to people. So anything that I can do, good or bad, or help point you in the direction, if I don't have the answer, I'll try to get you pointed in the, the right direction, and I, I, I hope that you feel uh, more empowered after our time together today. Yes, a lot, and, and it, it cleared me up and also gave me a little bit of confidence of of knowing, you know, okay, I'm going in the right direction, um, and that, you know, it's probably some small adjustments and, and, and really digging deeper. Like you said, being the DFS detective, maybe going a little bit deeper into, into certain aspects to just, you know, go to that next level. Yeah, man. The holy grail of this thing is a five-figure profit season. You've already done that, so you're clearly showing that you're a race car driver that belongs in the big leagues. And uh, 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 the way I see it is I have to repeat it to be able to be in that category. And, and that's, <laughs> and, and that's, I think that that is a good personal goal to have. And I think that every time you do it, cause that's, that's one of the things NBA is my best sport and I feel like I'm going to crush NBA, but I got to prove it. What I did last year doesn't matter. I got to go out and do it again. So I think that's a really good attitude to have. And I think that, you know, knowing that you know how to drive the car, you don't need to get in a new car. A lot of the times when these cars need to run better in NASCAR or Indy or whatever, we just need to make a couple of adjustments. So you're doing that. Just make those couple of adjustments and success leaves clues. If you're on the right path, you'll figure it out. Yep. I agree. All right. All right, Luis, I really appreciate you, man. I thank you so much for the support and checking out the site and the channel and signing up to do this thing. And yeah, man, please don't be a stranger. Hit me up and, and let me know how I can help you any way that I can, buddy. Perfect. Thank you very much. You got it. Talk to you soon. Thanks, bye.
making me manic the way you've been on me. You're making me panic the way you've been on me. Don't make it a habit of reaching for passion and addiction. Give me a job, I give her the business. See what she saw. Be quiet regardless. Keep leaking me on cause your body is flawless, girl. She be calling up. I be hanging up. She be balling. I do it to make enough. Yes, yeah, she love me, but baby, it ain't enough. I keep fucking the friends just to shake it up. Find a better man. Leave me jettison. They in the devil's a hell of a medicine. She like never that. I can never leave. It's confusing, but here's what she said to me. Slipping and caught, I'm stuck in my old ways, but you cannot stop. Hugs in the hallway and feel your heart drop. I open the door for you, run to the store for you, make some good love for you. Chivalry's overdue, working so hard for you, writing a song for you, making good love to you. I'm coming through. I'm the nicest of nice, cover the sun, have the nicest of nights. Shopping mall runs, no matter the price, we'll always have fun. Ignoring the fights, you'll always be right, I'll always be wrong. Keeping it light, never headstrong. You'll be alright, you just need to move on. Turn on that mic and hear you sing along. 